Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Dr. Rick here dropping in on you. Hope everybody is uh, having a great weekend. Um, me, I'm putting in work. This is going to be a busy weekend for me. Uh, don't forget, this is a fundraising push weekend. We are pushing to raise $10,000, um, which is a fraction of what it costs to do the things we do. And we're challenging those of you who believe in the work we do to step up and show some support and reach beyond uh, to help us do this. What I want to do today is I want to talk to you about some of the work we do and why it's important. But I want to talk to you in a manner that you can see how we're being impacted, uh, not from a point of complaining, but from a point of factual presentation um, to gain an understanding. One of the things you hear me say all the time is that we fail and we do so miserably because we don't know how things work. We are constantly under the gun because we fail to gain an understanding of how things work in this world. We don't know how we are being infect, uh, affected, so we cannot do anything about it. And so we sit around and we complain, but complaining isn't a plan. Whining isn't a plan. Whining or complaining isn't a strategy. We are going to have to do a better job of coming up with solutions. I have invested 30 years of my life plus, 30 plus years of my life into understanding many of the enigmatic issues that plague the black community uh, at a level that allows me to also present solutions and options and alternatives and mechanisms and means through which we can uh, effectively address these issues and create solutions and create avenues and paths to the things that are so important to us. I, 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 there are so many things I can talk and speak on that literally I could sit here and talk for days, but I'm going to focus on two things that are extremely important. Both of them are focused on our children. Uh, because one of the things that I feel like right now when I observe the black community is that it's almost as if we are content with sacrificing the future of our kids as long as we have halfway decent uh, access to things. If we can just present and pretend we are doing better than we are doing by buying things and going places, we're willing to ignore the long-term implications of our inactivity in addressing the need to solve some problems that are prevalent in our community. So I'm going to talk about some things to me that are extremely important and passionate because it does, it affects our future. We love to talk about how our children are our future, but we rarely take the time to sit down and think about what we're doing to create the possibilities and the probability of success for our children in the future and that's on us uh the first thing i'm going to talk about is the need for proper racial socialization something that has been uh something i've trumpeted and championed for decades and there's a reason for it um years ago i decided to uh when i and it, it and it came as i was preparing my response to this black on black crime thing and how it was being presented and, and i responded with the <clears throat> write-up 
uh, the myth of black on black crime. And it, it addressed the issue of violence within the black community, but how understanding that treating black violence any differently than any other violence in any any other form of violence in any other racial enclave was uh, it, 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 uh, disingenuous to say the least. And so I wrote on that because black on black uh, violence was a concept, an idea presented to present blacks in a different light and to produce a certain narrative about blacks. And it's not that blacks aren't harming each other. And it's not that it isn't an issue that we need to address. What it is, is that if I'm going to talk about black on black crime, then I must also talk about white on white crime, Asian on Asian crime, Arab on Arab crime, and on down the line. Why? Because if I actually look at the numbers, when we talk about uh, white homicides, 84% of homicides in the white community are committed by other what Caucasians or the white people. And that's going to be an enclave. Violence is a generally a, a passionate uh, display uh, and a reflection of anger and frustration and whatever else. And it's normally carried out within the proximity uh, in which you operate. Most people operate in racial proximity or in racial enclaves or in neighborhoods and communities with people who look and act and, and come from cultures they come from. So it is with understanding and reason that when we look that a lot of the violence experienced in the community is going to be black on black. It's not a phenomenon. It's a social uh, dynamic. <clears throat> but anyway, in doing that, uh, I became passionate about trying to understand this level of violence with our young men, primarily against one another, but also uh, an increasing proclivity to harm their mates as they go get older. And so I uh, conducted a study, I conducted research into African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. And I discovered uh, some of the risk factors of young black males committing violence. And there were five primary factors that stood out above all the others. And I'm gonna go from the bottom to the top. Number five was witnessing violence. Witnessing violence, um, no, we're gonna start with number five. I, I, I rearranged them. So number five to me is urban hassle. Urban hassle is uh, the experiences of inner city children that the average kid probably won't have to do. Urban hassle is everything from having to navigate gang violence to get to school and home from school, having to navigate drug activity to get to school and from home, get home from school, having to deal with sirens, guns, all types of activity at nighttime, all t during the night. Um, if you're in the uh, on the East Coast or in the Midwest, L tra trains all tire times of the night, just the noise and the bustle of the city uh, and, a, and an inability to find peace and tranquility to sink and get away from it all keeps a kid on edge. It increases their risk to perpetuate violence. And we're talking about specifically young black males. <clears throat> Number four is having uh, witness violence. Okay, having witness violence desensitizes an individual as far as violence is concerned, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that's number four. Number three is having been a victim of violence. Again, it's a desensitization uh, element and component of their environment. Number two is the lack of proper racial socialization. And number one is the feeling of being disrespected. And what I chose to focus on is the thing I felt we had the greatest capacity to control uh, up front, because trying to define respect without proper racial socialization, which includes racial identity, is a hard thing to do. And so what I did is I looked at how can we effectively racially socialized kids. We're in a natural construct. The kid is going to receive a great deal of that 
racial socialization within the home where dad and mom exist together and you get to observe manhood. You have a man who is effectively guiding you through the different phases of your growth and your development so that when you reach puberty, you're in a place where you can sit up and say, okay, right now, this is what we do with the boys at Black Men Lead, by the way. Right now, you are coming into this place where you're starting to go through puberty. You're going to experience your voice changing. That depth in voice uh, <clears throat> audibility is for a reason. It is more intimidating than your original voice. It is meant to send a message that I possess a certain capacity and it's the first warning to anybody who attempts to harm the things that matter to you. Then you're going to get stronger. You're going to get bigger than your female counterpart of the same age. This, th 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 then you're going to have this, the same thing that's causing all of this is testosterone. And this testosterone is also going to make you a little more aggressive a little more edgy, a little bit more willing to tangle with something. And all of these things, the, 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 the voice intimidation, the strength, the aggression, isn't meant to aim at the people you love. It's not meant to aim at her because now you're stronger and you're bigger and you wanna execute or exercise your power or control over her. It's meant to protect her. It is designed so that now you can do what you were designed to do. Your first and foremost responsibility as a black man is to protect. There's a great deal of emphasis on the commodification of black men that how much can they contribute financially? And a man does need to be a provider. That's number two. Out of the five P's of manhood, protect, provide in that order, one and two. But before any male is in a position to be an effective provider, they're already in a position to be an effective protector because protecting is the first thing that they're responsible for doing. And in that proper vein of socialization is where it's done. But now in a normal environment, it will happen in the home. But what you got to understand is we're in a situation now where compared to 1960, when 75% of black children were born in two-parent households, we're now in a situation where it's the reverse. And we're not in a situation where 1.5 million black men are missing from the community. 1.3 of them are incarcerated. And it's a direct result of the failure to properly racially socialize and the focus of an outward force on the disintegration and the destruction of the black family nucleus. See, without the nucleus, you lose the ability and the power to properly develop, educate, prepare, and socialize your children to go out into a world that is inherently hostile towards them and effectively and successfully compete. And so that's a problem. But see, since they're not there, what, you, what do you have to do? You have to have a rite of passage that covers the ground that may not be covered in the home. There has to be a universal understanding, a universal standard of what is expected, what is demanded. There has to be a code of behavior, a code of conduct. There has to be a standard. And see, there's no rite of passage. That's why I created Black Man Lead as a rite of passage. We need to first be able to define what Black manhood is. How do Black men need to carry themselves in order for Black people to prosper and elevate and become empowered. How and what role does the black man pay in providing the safe space and environment for the black women in our world to flourish and execute their power? See, this is a unified thing, but if you don't understand it, if you don't teach it, you have a bunch of young men thinking that black women are the enemy. You have a bunch of black men who will think that complaining about black women is the way to fix the problems in their lives. Now, this is no past to black women. This isn't what this is about. This is talking about the development of young black men. See, the thing is, I don't care who you have a problem with. If you don't properly socialize young black males, they will always see what's coming against them and never see the thing on the inside of them that allows them to stand up and be effective in the world around them, despite what they're facing. See, if as long as I don't understand who I am, I'm always going to be looking at everything else for the reason things are going wrong in my life. And I'll never be able to fix anything. I'll always be the victim and I'll never execute power because I don't understand who I am. There has been an ongoing campaign 
to uh, attack the identity of black man, to ensure that they don't have the type of socialization that they need in order to operate and function. And I've talked about that. There are some benefits to the messages that go along. With, let me let, let me explain something to you. When we talk about racial socialization, I want to be clear here before I move on. And, um, and, and when we talk about racial socialization, we're talking about a, a subsector of effective parenting in, in socializing. Every parent, regardless of race, has to socialize their kid. It's the messages they send. You're beautiful. You're smart. You're capable. This is what you can do. You can do all of these things are part of their socialization. Number one is always going to be identity. And in the homes where people understand, no matter what race, they're teaching racial identity. Why? Because racial identity is going to directly impact and provide instruction on how I'm going to carry myself and function in this world. Where do I fit in based on how I I see myself. When you don't properly racially socialize, see, there's the socialization and the racial socialization, especially for black kids. Look, you're beautiful. You're gorgeous. The way your hair is, is perfectly fine. The way your nose is, is perfectly fine. You're going to go out there and you're going to hear that you're intellectually inferior. The truth of the matter is you are intellectually exceptional. You're intellectually phenomenal. There are some things. Matter of fact, that would not be half the things you see around here. If our ideas and our situations and our creations weren't stolen from us and then, uh, misappropriated and, and, and put out and, and, and retitled, renamed and all this other stuff. We are the creators. We are the innovators. We are dynamic. There's absolutely nothing you're going to run into in this world that when you look at it, you decide you want to do something about it, that you can't change it. But see, that's racial socialization. You're preparing them. But another level is also racial socialization and the idea of gender responsibility. Here's the thing. As a man, you're going to have some responsibility. Number one is that a black man never brings harm or does harm to a black woman. Absolutely under no circumstances. Number one rule, a black man never does harm to a black woman. Number two, a black man always takes responsibility for his actions. Number three, a black man is always preparing and developing himself to be financially capable of supporting his family. It's not where you start, it's where you're headed, it's what you're doing. It's nothing wrong with having to start at the bottom. There's nothing wrong with having to work your way up. There's nothing wrong with not being there and not having arrived. But what you can't do is be content with begging someone else to help you support your family when the person that you're begging benefits from you not being able to. All of these things are a part of socialization. But here's the thing. What we know from the research we've done, from the work we've done, from the programs that we created is that when we properly socialize these young boys, they are less likely to be violent, not only towards one another, but, but towards uh, the women in their lives and their children. They are also more likely to finish schools, which indirectly impacts the lowering of their risk to become incarcerated. Because we understand that if you drop out of school, you become five times more likely to become incarcerated. Once you become incarcerated, you become three times more likely to, seventy. no, I take it back, yeah, 75% uh, more likely to recidivate or to reoffend and to return to prison. And so there's this cycle that's created and within that cycle is an entirely new type of socialization. Uh, you can call it institutionalization or whatever you want to, but it is designed to keep you coming back. And if you don't understand who you are, you can get, you can make one mistake and you can survive it if you know who you are in the system. You can make a mistake in the system, get in the system and survive it if you know who you are. But if you don't know who you are, the system is going to tell you. And then you're going to find your pecking order in that system in order to feel important within it. But, 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 but when you know who you are, you sit up and you acknowledge, hey, I made the wrong move. I'm going to go back out here. I'm going to get my shit together and I'm going to turn my life around because what? My family needs me. My children need me. My wife or my future wife needs me. My community needs me. There's something inside of me that is driving me to be the best that I can be. And I cannot allow this to happen again. So I'm going to search inside of myself and tap into this beauty that I am because I know who I am. Racial identity is so important, um, and we are missing that. Um, racial identity, academic achievement, racial identity in social engagement, pro-social engagement, family performance, 
uh, how a man operates as a husband and a father is going to be directly attached to how well he is socialized. We have so much work to do in that. I've been talking about it over and over again. There is so much need. I've been talking about creating a national initiative where now, now I reach around wherever once somebody reaches out and taps into me, I try to touch with what limited resources I have. I try to touch, but we need to have literally, we need to have chapters in every city in this country where we are training and teaching boys what it means to be black men, not subjugated black men, not men who are looking to be accepted by the system, but men who are unapologetic, unapologetic, excuse me, in their blackness. And then willing to operate and stand up and perform what's necessary of them from protecting to providing to being priest in their homes to being prophet as they speak over their wives and their children to setting the path and the direction to being business owners to leading the the the, the, the charge to close the wealth gap by effectively moving and managing their money and their finances all of this is a part of this socialization, pro socialization process that we are absolutely missing on. So when I'm asking people to support what we're doing, I'm not asking you for the sake of, hey, I'm out here throwing a little thing around. I've been in this game and anybody knows, I've, I've been on social media sharing my work for what, 15 years? Something like that. 13, 14, I mean, some, some, some time. And I was doing it years before that. And here's the thing. The work still needs to be done. And here's what I can tell you. It's not being done in the industrial, uh, in the nonprofit industrial complex. They're ciphering millions out of the hands of people who want to see change. And nothing's happening because they are not investing it in programs, in practices, in principles, in, 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 in social ideologies that work. They're presenting a good picture. They're showing you what you want to see. Great photo ops, great uh, optics, but no real practical application. They know what works and what won't work. They will never get behind in any real, true, serious manner the things that work because they benefit from us being at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. They're never going to do it. They're going to give you the, oh, we're pumping millions into this. We, 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 we gave 6.5 million to this. We did this. We did this. But you, what you have to look at is what type of results are you getting? If the wealth gap is widening, if the crime is increasing, if the violence is increasing, if, 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 the number of blacks hovering above and at the poverty line is increasing, then we have to ask ourselves why. And that's the problem. The places in which people are actually investing and doing the things that matter, no traction because blacks gravitate towards the shiny thing. We're either investing our time in celebrity gossip, comedy, and all this stuff. And I'm not saying that you don't need a place to tap into. I love music. I love movies. But let me tell you something. There has to be something that I'm investing in that comes back to me. Because if I'm going and I'm paying for all these movies and none of this stuff is benefiting me, what am I doing for me? What am I doing for myself? What am I doing for my progeny and my offspring that speak to the nature and the power of what's necessary in our communities? That's the thing we're not doing. The next thing I want to talk to you about is, again, our children, but not just boys. So I want to talk to you about adverse childhood experiences. Again, me in my research, trying to understand the different dilemmas that we face. And I was doing my research for one uh, of my research projects, dealing with uh, what I consider to be collective uh, missteps 
within the black community. And I deemed it uh, collective cognitive bias syndrome theory uh, that we were operating off of a collective bias that had been passed down to us uh, from our ancestors who were slaves and on down the line and we operate and function and we knit, we almost always call these missteps culture. When, we, when the truth of the matter is they were reflections of trauma. And so uh, much in the same vein with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Joy DeGru, uh, who gave us her beautiful work in post-traumatic slave syndrome. I decided to look and go and delve a little deeper uh, into the world of epigenetics, which I discovered actually by uh, studying uh, the behavior of Jews after the Holocaust and ultimately came in contact with epigenetics. And I'm not going to get greatly into epigenetics, but I am going to share some of the things about it. But what I, what I found is because my whole my whole point was to address this whole collective cognitive bias thing, but also to answer uh, the naysayers who kept saying, man, uh, at the time I started this, it was some years ago. It's been 150 years now, but back then it was 100, maybe 125, 130. It's been 100 and something years, let's just say that. And y'all still talking about slavery. Let it go, it's time to move on. And so the idea is, you, you can't possibly still be dealing with the negative impact of slavery. So I had to go back with, or is, is, is this multi-generational trauma thing real? And the work that I've been able to put together, the work that's out there, the combination of it, it's absolutely being perpetuated generation by generation, but it's not just being reflected in the way we think. It's not just being reflected in some of our reactive uh, behavior. It's being reflected in our health, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, a lot of the things that we think are, uh, you know, carcinogen, uh, carcinogens and everything like that, the vast majority of our cancers are stress driven by environmental stressors that come from the stuff that's passed down. Epigenetics explains all of this. Epigenetics is basically the study of how our environment and our stre uh, environmental stress and trauma experiences dictate how our genes respond to the messages being sent by way of our uh, genetic code or DNA code. We're now starting to understand that DNA code, it was initially said that it was always above the gene, meaning that it couldn't re rewrite the DNA sequence. But now we're starting to see that as DNA is being transcribed into RNA, that we are actually starting to see that in highly stressful situations, the code can actually be changed. So basically, in essence, you have 23 chromosomes from the female, 23 chromosomes from the male that come together to create 46 chromosomes of a new being uh, by way of ovum, fetus, blah, 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 on out, right? Well, the natural evolutionary process of, re of the reproductive system creates this process in which uh, all genetic malfunctions that take place in either one of the parents is generally washed away during the process. Sperm is constantly being produced and the egg, if not fertilized, is what? Dismissed and passed on during the, the uh, menstrual cycle. And then a new egg comes out. And this entire process of meiosis, which is recreating all the cells of the reproductive system, male and female, is different from any other cellular reproduction, uh, which is mitosis in any other area of the body. And there's a reason for that. But however, what we know now is that in situations where there are highly intensive levels of stress or trauma, these epigenetic tags, these chemical uh, uh, notes over the gene that impact gene performance weren't being completely washed away. They were being passed down through procreation. This is how... Uh, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were having dreams of things that happened to their grandparents during the Holocaust. Things that, and they were accurate and vivid, but they were things their grandparents had never even shared, not even with their parents. 
and they would tell these stories and, 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 and it was like, wow. So they started to study it and we start to find out that literally genetically, each one of our cells holds a memory and the memory holds trauma. Uh, Basil van der Kolk, uh, is by far the most brilliant mind in trauma that I've ever studied. I've studied and I've gone through so much of his work to build the foundation on what work I would do. And he wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. And it talks about how trauma is stored in the body. And then when I started doing my study in epigenetics, here we go. And why am I talking about epigenetics? Because there's a subcategory of epigenetics uh, called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And what we now know about adverse childhood spirit experiences is that uh, there are these different ACEs uh, that I'm going to share with you. And they impact our children and they impact any child. But I'm talking specifically about our children because we are more prone to have ACEs in our community because of the dynamic of our community. And here's the thing. It's not just a psychological experience. These traumatic experiences, these stressors within the community that impact children at a different perspective. You understand that uh, trauma impacts you neurologically. It impacts you biologically. It impacts you psychologically. It impacts you sociologically. And so when you sit up and say, okay, that's happening. Imagine that happening to a child that's still developing neurologically, biologically, psychologically, and sociologically. It's going to be a more emphatic impact. And then it plays out in long-term health implications. And so let me tell you something. And here's why I'm frustrated. A couple of weeks ago, I did a workshop for uh, Wellspring, which is a clinic owned by one of my friends, a very close friend, Dr. David Jones. Um, he owns Wellspring and it's a full service to the community. Uh, he gets, you know, different connections and stuff like that, but he works. And as you can see, that is right next to that, the Harris County Sheriff's Office. Well, Wellspring has a uh, opportunity to work with uh, Harris County Sheriff's Office through a grant that's given to the Harris County Sheriff's Office, Office reentry program, which is ran by a black major, uh, a major in the sheriff's department. He's a major uh, in, in rank in the sheriff's office. So he's high ranked, but he's black. He has a group of people working for him uh, predominantly minorities, but there are a few whites. Um, and I was asked to come in and obviously, you know, with me, there are always my reservations when it comes to dealing with these public organizations, because again, my, my understanding and my, my acknowledgement of history and experience says we love spinning our wheels, but we don't like really going anywhere. We just want to present an image. I didn't get that from these people, but this is new. This is new to the major. This is new. He just took it over. Uh, he's excited about it. He wants to bring me and have me do things, you know, within the department, uh, sheriff's department. Uh, they want to stream some of my messages live to the inmates and all this. And all that stuff's great. But here's my thing is how are we impacting our people? I'm going to tell you why this frustrated me. It wasn't doing the presentation. I love sharing what I do. And I speak to audiences of all backgrounds. So I work with people and I have no problem working with any other group, but my group is always going to be prioritized first. My passion is always going to be first. I'm unapologetically black. I have a major problem when there's so much need in my home to be out doing stuff in everybody else's. But here's the problem. This opened the door for me to work with some kids in the inner city. Here's the challenge. I don't get to say just black. So energy and effort and time that I could be investing in my kids, I'll be helping other kids who aren't black. As, as a man and, and a human being, I don't have a problem with that because I think everybody needs to improve. As if everybody improves, the world improves as a whole. And But I'm not ignorant to the racial construct. I'm not ignorant to the disadvantages that my people inherit. And so I have a problem spending so much energy and effort and time somewhere else, not because I don't care about that. It's because I care about what's going on here. And for every one of them, I help somebody over here that needed me that won't get it. But if I don't, if I don't do it because my people aren't supporting, my people won't back this. So they're coming in they say, we see your work. 
we've read your work. We want you to show us what it's about. And so we did this thing on epigenetics and adverse childhood experiences. And I'm going to just read off the 10. And, you know, it was a nice little presentation. People showed up. It was all good and everything I've done. I've, I've literally been invited to the International Epigenetic Council on Cancer, uh, Frankfurt, Germany. I've, I mean, I've, I've spoke on this thing. And the last thing I, I'm, I'm getting into this to learn about is cancer. But when you find out that it impacts the capacity to develop zines, uh, these diseases, you know. So here, here, here we are. There are 10 primary ACEs, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, alcoholic parent, an incarcerated family member, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death or abandonment, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, a mother is a victim of domestic violence or your primary. Now, there are obviously other stresses, but those are the primary that are designated ACEs. I'm sorry, y'all, I ate nuts right before that it's a couple of my i should have did something but i i apologize but y'all going to work with me on this look so out of these now each one of these 10 count as one ace one point 68 percent between 65 and 68 percent of every person every adult in this in this in this world um well, no, every adult in the U.S. I want to be careful in how I call this. Every adult in the U.S., 67 to, I think it's 67%. It goes anywhere from 61 to 67, depending on the study. There are a couple of studies. I take a lot of my stuff from uh, some recent stuff, but also the original CDC Kaiser study that really opened up the whole notion to this, uh, which is a little outdated. But there are a lot of other works going on, including works that I'm uh, currently engaged in myself. But each one of those is a point. All you need is four ACEs and your long-term health implications are pretty dire. So let me explain to you what I'm talking about. A kid with four ACEs is, as an adult, four times, I mean, 12 times more likely to attempt to kill themselves, attempt suicide. 12 times more likely than a kid with no ACEs. Okay. A kid with four ACEs is, what, four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the U.S., Okay, they are three times more likely to develop what? Type two diabetes, to become obese and all of the things that come with that, to develop alcoholism, uh, four times more likely to develop an autoimmune uh, disease like lupus. Here's where it gets real interesting. 3.5 times more likely to develop uh, certain cancers including breast cancer, um, brain cancer, throat cancer, and several others. These environmental influences are stressors. And here's the thing, the longer the, and here's the problem too. The vast majority of them won't like, it's not like they're aging out of their trauma. They're aging out of their experiences. They're aging out of the suffrage they are going through this and things are just perpetuating themselves number one is traumatized people tend to behave in a certain ways that open them up for different negative experiences an inability to maintain healthy relationships an inability to function in certain environments um to become more emotionally explosive uh, hypervigilant, a bunch of other things that are directly associated with that, that make it very difficult for them to get on and really thrive in the world. So they are constantly reaping the benefits on the social level, but they are also experiencing health implications. And in an environment where Black men just lost three years on life expectancy, we should really be looking at this. In the last, what, five years, Black men have lost three years in life expectancy three years. And that sounds simple, but three years in a short period of time is astronomical. That's three years. That means you take all the black men and you say that when you average this thing out, we've lost three years. That's a lot of lives where lives are cut short a whole lot more than three years. See, it's not that every man is going to live to be 75. A lot are going to die earlier than that. And all of it isn't violence. A lot of it is health implications, prostate cancer, heart attack, cancer. 
and it's directly linked to adverse childhood experiences. Epigenetics, I've been talking about this. We have a problem and we're not addressing it. We're not getting into it. I funded all of my research because we don't see the importance in investing in the intellectual examination of our issues, the, str the strategic examination of our issues. We just want to complain. And what social media has done for us has actually made us feel like getting on and saying something and saying it with some with some some oomph and, and, and push is tantamount to power. It's just a temper tantrum on a social platform that you don't even own. All the while, the real true capacity to change things is within the community by having answers and solutions. Just imagine an organization. And there's a reason I share this when it when it happened. Uh, if you go back and you look at my channel, I shared this when it happened. And, you know, and then I did what I did and move on because what they think about me isn't that important. I really don't care what nobody thinks about me. That's why I don't really go around trying to validate myself. Look at my work. My work validates me. But, but I'm going to tell you something. For a group of people where the vast majority of them don't look like me, saying we want you to come speak on i'm not an md i haven't conducted a great deal of research in cancer but what i have done is conducted an astronomical amount of research into epigenetics and one of the things that i consistently see is its impact on gene uh gene expression and how the gene is transcribing the DNA information that's coming out of each gene and how that's turning into diseases based on the level of stress and strife and everything else that's going on in an individual's life. I can talk on that for days. I can sit down with your MDs. I can sit down with your oncologists. I can sit down with all of them and we can have this conversation because that much I understand. But I also, on the very, uh, surface level, understand what it's doing to our people. You know, we've talked about psychosomatics for a long time. The direct correlation between mind and body both ways. If you take care of your body, your mind will be healthy the same way. If you take care of your mind, your body will be healthy. There is a level of stress created in the mind by way of thought, fear, anxiety, anger, all of this stuff negatively impacts the body. Trauma responses that involve fear also wreak havoc on the body. Why? Because the fear response automatically triggers what? The fight or flight response, which what? Triggers the adrenal gland to do what? Release adrenaline and cortisol into the body. That's all great when you got a bat chasing you. That's what that fear response is for. It's to sit up and say, I'm either going to fight to defend myself or I'm going to run to get away from the threat. It's good for about a, a couple of minutes tops. It's just meant to get you to somewhere safe or to put you in a safe situation. I always ask the question, what happens when a child takes the bear home every day? We talk about chronic stress, but we don't understand the implications of how it's impacting our lives long term. What happens when something that was meant to be 30 seconds becomes constant all day long? Well, here's what we know. In short bursts, adrenaline and cortisol are great for defending yourself or getting away and providing an ability to do. Here's what happens in long term. Because the fight or flight response is about a physical uh, reaction and, 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 and uh, activity, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex and redirects the blood and oxygen that would normally flow to the prefrontal cortex to the extremities, the arms and the legs. Why? Because I'm either going to fight or I'm going to run. 
The problem is what why is that well you always talk about well what were they thinking when this happened what were they thinking when they were getting arrested why didn't they just do this why let me tell you why because the moment that a person goes into fight or flight and that prefrontal cortex shuts down you just shut down the executive function of your brain the part that makes reasonable decisions that examines things that 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 that, that controls impulse so now you're doing impulsive things. And you don't know why the prefrontal cortex is shut down. But this happens as long as you're in fight or flight. So it's not just when people look at it and see it. As long as I'm stressing about something, there's a part of my brain that's not functioning fully. That's where the fog comes in. That's why you can't focus a lot. It's because the prefrontal cortex isn't getting the oxygen and blood supply that you get. These are some things that we don't understand on a level that we need to understand. This is why I do what I do. Sitting up and seeing something on the surface that's happening out in the world without understanding how it's taking place, why it's taking place, what can be done about it is futile. We've got to be able to sit up and say, who are the minds that can create the solutions? Those are the people we should be funding. Those are the people that we should be celebrating. And I'm not talking about celebrating me. I'm talking about there are minds out there that have just gone by the wayside because all we saw was some people who can talk and it was cool to listen, but we weren't really paying attention. It's absolutely unacceptable that you have people that can do unbelievable things that are doing it. We just wasted Dr. Claude Anderson, if you ask me. God, I thank you for the fact that I got a chance to interact with this man. When I decided to create the blueprint for black empowerment, I submitted it to uh, Dr. Anderson. Well, actually, I had to first get through his wife, Joanne because she's standing guard because even in his 80s and i think he had just turned 80 when i first went at, went to go try to connect with him you know he was approaching 80 or right at 80 and i presented it and she was like hey look i i i appreciate this but i'm gonna look at it because he's so passionate about it if you say anything black he's gonna say yes and he's not as uh, healthy as he used to be. He's not as strong, physically strong as he used to be. So I've got to be careful about it. But if I look at it and I think it's something that he needs to see, I'll show it to him. And she did. And we went back and forth and we exchanged ideas. Uh, we had some disagreements. Uh, he, he's, he, 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 he's at a point, I don't know if he's still there, but at the time we had this conversation, it was just coming on 2013, which was his deadline. He said that if we don't take some massive action, uh, by 2013 and really to start doing some things differently from an economic perspective, we were going to become a permanent underclass. He had gotten to the point where he believed that had already happened and I refused to accept it. Now, uh, a lot of that is just the never quit in me. I don't believe you're defeated until you're dead uh, type mentality. But overall, he was very uh, proud of the work I did. One of the things that his wife, Joanne, said, she says, I love the fact that anytime you mention the work of anyone else, including my husband, you gave them credit for it. Absolutely. I just happened to be blessed to come along at a time when there were so many people who came before me who put in the work that they laid the foundation that I just jumped on and went absolute nuts. I've been a, a natural researcher since before I was 10. I read like a crazy amount of information and data daily. I want to leave an imprint in this world. I want to be a catalyst of change. I want to be someone, <clears throat> someone who touches lives. And I'm doing that on a number of different levels. My businesses are allowing me to do that for people. I want to do it for my people. I want to do it for the people who can't afford to pay me. And in many ways I do, I do as much as I can. But I need people to understand the gravity of this thing. See, this is great, but the problem is <clears throat> there's a couple of things. First and foremost, <clears throat> I can't say I'm focusing on a black issue. That's not going to fly. I can, I can use the term inner city. And anytime someone starts to dilute the focus, when it stops being black people, it starts being people of color. When it stops being black children, it starts being inner city children. We're creating a situation where we are slowly pulling away from the thing we should be focused on. And we are uh, diluting our energy, our effort, our resources 
and other people are benefiting from them. Right now, we have the LGBTQ community benefiting from us. We have the Latino community benefiting from us. We have the Asian community benefiting from us because we did not protect the solitude of our racial identity and the responsibility of us to thrive and support and build and grow on our own. We sacrificed for the purpose of getting them to infuse something into what we say we want to do. And it's never been for our benefit. Anytime they pour money into something we want, it's because they see a way to benefit from it. And it's never going to be to our full benefit because they benefit best when we don't. That's That's got to be the litmus test of black people. If white people funding it, stay the fuck away from it. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some legitimate white people who literally care about the plight of black people, but they can't care about it from the level that I've experienced it because they haven't experienced it. They care about it because they look at it and say, this is some BS. And they will literally give in. Some of the people, when I was going through the roughest time of my life, some of the people that reached out to me when I was reaching out to blacks were them, white people. So I understand that they're out there. But what I also understand is that the system that they live in isn't built for me. And if I'm operating and I'm trying to do things within this system, I understand that I'm at a disadvantage. So my eyes and my my focus is always on doing something outside of the system. Building our own, doing our own, serving our own. So when I'm asking you to give to what we're doing, I'm not talking about some small thing. I'm not talking about, hey, we're going to throw a carnival this weekend. I'm almost at 80,000 hours. Now, I've done so much research, I, I don't even want to talk about it, but logged hours just on the black enigma. Redlining, gentrification, mass incarceration, miseducation, uh, child, adverse childhood experience, and multigenerational trauma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the black community almost 80,000 hours. That's just me. That's not everything that's going on. That's just Rick Wallace going after it over 30 years. Nobody funded that. Nobody. Me. Then I didn't just do it and publish it and sit back and say, hey, you can read my stuff. Let me go around and do lectures everywhere and get paid by the people that are struggling and suffering to hear me lecture about what they're going through and not, I went immediately into problem, solve, problem solving mode. Every program at the, uh, the uh, Odyssey Project is a response to my discoveries, my learning, my research, my observations to in order to create something. I, I, when I come and I share with you and I talk to you, I don't do a whole lot of quoting and citing and all that stuff. I've done that work. I'm talking to you where you can understand me. I'm talking to you where you can hear me. But trust me when I tell you, I'm that dude. I've put in that work. I know what's going on. And I'm trying at, at, at every with every ounce of my being to get my people to understand we got a problem. Things aren't getting better for us. They're getting worse. This isn't me just saying how I feel. This is me looking at the numbers. This is me observing situations and different moves. And because we don't understand how things work, we are unaware of the uh, mechanisms and machinations at play, and we are getting played. Someone said the other day, we're playing ourselves. Can't remember who that was. Uh, but it was definitely it was one of one of uh, the regulars said we're, we're playing ourselves and then at a level we are we're playing ourselves every time we go out and think that we can present that we've arrived by how many Mercedes we buy, uh, how many pair of Jordans we buy our children or do we get our children the latest version of the iPhone and, and, and look where I'm traveling to this week and look where I'm traveling to that week. But all you have to do is lose your income in three months. Is going to be a problem. Or even the ones who have developed a certain level of wealth, but won't share it with everybody else how they got there, won't walk people through it. That's why I created the Legacy Wealth Academy. I went and talked to them people. Yeah, them people. But I didn't just talk to 
uh, the average them people. I talk to the people that when you say their name about money, you know who it is. The Ray Dalios, the David Swenson, the Warren Buffetts. If I didn't speak to them directly, you'd be surprised how accessible these people is or how much they just want to yap, yap, yap about how they got what they got. It's a big difference in billionaires and newly uh, established millionaires. Those guys that are just getting it are very protective of it. They are very stingy with it because they still competing. They think that if I give it to you, then I lose something. Them guys up there understand the more people I set off, the more people I win. They get an understanding. They got this and they just share. But if I didn't hear from them in person, if I didn't talk to them over the phone, if I didn't get the few rare occasions where I got to sit down and talk to them, I got email responses. And those that I couldn't talk to get email responses or text messages from, I sit down and I read all of their books. All of them. I read, I watched every interview and I took every principle and I put it into this 18 month course. Solutions. So you can't keep talking about closing the wealth gap and nobody's giving you the uh, information and the mechanisms and the tools you need to build wealth. And the thing is, no matter what color you are, no matter how poor you are, you can start building wealth today. Literally. You can scratch up $10. If you can scratch up $10, you can start building wealth today. But nobody's teaching it. Nobody's teaching about how to use insurance and annuities. Nobody's teaching about how to set up uh, trusts in order to perpetuate wealth, to protect wealth and everything else. Nobody's looking at how wealth is passed down by the ultra wealthy. No, nobody's everybody's talking it, but nobody's looking at the mechanisms and do it. And then they are benefiting off of our consumer mindedness at a level you don't understand. I said this before and I'm going to say it again. We, we got to be the only race of people in the history of mankind that literally finances our own demise. And you're saying, well, Doc, how do you do that? Every time we spend into their economy for things we don't need. We are enriching and empowering them. The very people we complain about oppressing us. We are spending into their economy, thereby empowering them to do to us what we say we don't like having done to us. And until we get out of the mindset that instead of having those shoes, I'm going to buy some stock. Yeah, investing in the stock is helping them, but it's also giving you a lever. I'm going to buy some property. More than the house. Let me explain. So the real estate is so dope more than the house, that property and the different rights that come with that property. Whole nother level, but we won't get on it. Soon as we inherit something, we'll sell it land. We'll own a house and sell it to rent. Because we are cash lovers and cash is the weakest way to hold your wealth. It's the most vulnerable and volatile element and component of your net worth. Being cash heavy will set you up to take a hard hit each and every time. They know how to hide their wealth. They know where to put their wealth. Why do you think rich people are always buying art? Because they just like the way it looks. Half that shit ain't even on the walls in their house. It's in storage somewhere. Why do you think they own it? Because the moment they buy it, they insure it. And it's got a held value. Prime example. You've heard me say this before. Prime example. It's not really a real example, but it's a great an 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 analogy. Uh, 1983, I want to say. Eddie Murphy plays in this movie called Trading Places, where he's a bomb. Two brothers uh, who are billionaires decide to have this experiment. One believes that you, you're born with it. Others, The other one believes it's environment, meaning that if placed in the right environment, any person can be successful. So to prove his point, he kidnaps Eddie Murphy. And Eddie Murphy wakes up after being drunk or whatever, wakes up and he's in this mansion. And he starts just stuffing all this stuff in his car. He said, hey, you don't have to steal it. It belongs to you. It's yours. And Eddie Murphy says, so all this is mine, all this. So that means if I take this vase right here and throw it and break it on the ground and he breaks it and, and one of the brothers says, hey, we paid 50000 for that. And the other brother says, but we insured it for seventy. And I didn't get it then. I was a kid. I was in high school. 
when I start studying money, I'm 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 a comedy fan. And I come across the movie again, and this time it's like it hits me like a ton of bricks. I be damn. That's how they put their wealth. And when you see them buying cars and keeping a collection, it ain't about flaws. It's about that car collection is insured. And that's one of the things is it's not an asset if it can't be used for collateral as a loan, for, to get a loan, and it can't be insured. So it has to be uh, insurable, and it has to have the ability to be used as collateral when necessary to a, as a security for a loan, if, and that's an asset. And they just find different ways to put that money in assets. One of the biggest assets that you can also have is your business. So much of a person's net worth who uh, who figured this out is going to be in their business because the business is scalable and growing. And it can be adapted to multiple environments. What makes my company so important to me in the developer well is I have a real concern about the U.S. dollar because it's fiat currency. My business, and I spend a lot of time developing the capacity to work with people outside of the U.S. So then my business can accept any currency as form of payment. It's important to understand all these different things. But back to the thing that I want to talk about. While I'm going to do this program, I don't have a choice. We should be funneling money into programs that we can do this for our kids specifically. This isn't about dismissing or, or not caring about other children. I'm not that person. There are some black people that don't care. There are some hardcore warriors that don't care. I'm not that person. I'm not going to lie and say I am, but I am a person that's unapologetically black and my blackness precedes me. When I walk in a room, I don't, I don't walk in as a PhD. I don't walk in as... Uh, a business owner. I walk in as a black man and everything else has got to be determined after the fact. Nobody's looking at my vehicle and knowing whether I've got a degree or not, or knowing that I'm a business owner, or knowing what my net worth is. They just see a person in the car and that person's black. So because I know my children and my grandchildren are coming up in that same environment, I have to understand that I need to prepare my children and the future of their children, their children, by laying a foundation. And so when I'm telling you that I'm asking for your support, this isn't some small thing. That should be an outpouring. That should be a, a, a way and a means of doing this. We are failing because we will not unify in the area in which we need to unify. J. Edgar Hoover said that the greatest threat to U.S. security, national security, isn't the Russians. At that time, the Soviet Union, it wasn't Cuba. We had just had the missile crisis. They were aiming missiles off here. It ain't them. It ain't the Middle East with all the Arabs who can't stand our guts. It's black unity. He said black unity. You know why? All of them understand what happens if we ever come together, if we ever decide that we're going to start funding black growth. We're going to start funding black empowerment. We're going to start funding black health. We're going to start funding black advancement and development for our youth. We're going to start funding black business development, black residential development, black investment uh, mechanisms that we're going to literally sit up and take the 1.4 trillion in spending power everybody loves to talk about, but no damn body understands. And we're going to actually start to turn it in on our community. So, yeah, I'm asking for support, but I'm not asking in some small way. I'm telling you, this is what I've done. This is what I do. We need to do better. Look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I went over. It was supposed to be an hour. I went over. But it was worth every bit of it. So I'm challenging you. We need to do better. Go to the description box. Click that link and give. This week, we're this weekend. We're trying to raise ten thousand dollars. It is a fraction of what it takes to run this organization. But someone told me not that long ago that something's better than nothing. So this is what I'm aiming at. Because if I told you what it would take to make this thing pop for a year, it would blow your mind. But it's necessary. That's the problem. We become so cheap with the thing that should be the most valuable to us: our children, our future. 
and we'll go splurge at, at all the nice places. We'll splurge on the cars, on the clothes, we'll splurge on the trip and come back to the same bull crap and mess we've been living in since we were born and complain about it. We'll show up at that work with blood pressure through the roof because we're stressed out and we have a chance to do something about it, but we don't. This is the reality of it. So on that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. Go to the description box. Click the link or give by way of Cash App. Uh, but whatever you do, show some support. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like it. That just ain't good. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I